Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda, Cities ABC and Open Business Council series. We are a fast-growing YouTube and podcast thought leadership channel focused on profiling the global leading inspiring people, CEOs, authors, technologists, academics, and people that are framing and creating a new vision for our world, especially looking at solutions how we can actually get better results for the problems that we are facing. In this channel, we've been actually highlighting ideas, products, inventions, software, books and solutions to the multiple challenges and opportunities we face in our cities and our society. But we face specially and we actually profile special people. People that are inspiring, people that are doing fantastic projects and people that are trying to transform our world with all the areas and all the challenge from fourth industrial revolution to blockchain, AI, and all the frontier tech technologies that are disrupting and as well accelerating our evolution as humanity. This podcast series are produced and distributed on citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org and syndicated on intelligenthq.com, fashionabc.org, edgefink.com and tradersdna.com, our associate partners and as well media platforms. So um, I have a huge honor today to have with us uh, James Keyes. Um, that is quite a global personality in the management world and uh, he's been leading two of the biggest corporations in the planet before. And as well, someone that has been always keeping on pushing things, both in terms of innovation, education, which is one of his great passions, but as well aeronautics and as he's joining us actually from an airport which is quite exciting i would actually love to be there with you but uh, i wanted to welcome to our series um it's a huge honor james to have you here and i'm actually very excited to make this interview with you thank you i'm delighted to be joining you today so um James, someone like you that has been leading some of the biggest uh, corporations in the planet. So I would like to normally, most of these came to education, came to your drive, family. I would like to know a bit what made you be who you are. And then probably can be from your parents, from your family, or from a lot of different things, but I'd like to hear that because it's for me one of the most inspiring things is leading, listening to the histories of people, especially someone that achieved so much as you did. Thank you for the opportunity to share that because it's a, it's a bit unusual. Um, I am, I, I see myself as one of the luckiest guys in the world uh, for having dealt with as much adversity as I had to deal with growing up. And that's, it's a bit unusual. You wouldn't think that someone would feel that way, that they'd be grateful for the uh, challenges they faced as a child. Uh, but you know, as so many of us uh, growing up, uh, in my case, was not easy. It was, uh, we didn't have any money. I grew up with, in a family with too many kids and not enough money and, and both parents working and then parents getting divorced and then uh, uh, having to confront uh, things like, um, you know, basically not enough, not enough food, um, a house being condemned uh, for the lack of running water, if you can believe that. Uh, having to, at some point, uh, when uh, my parents divorced and my father had died, live with, living with my mother in a trailer park as a child. Um, th these were experiences that you might look back and say, boy, that was, just, that was just terrible. But what I found is that the more adversity people face in their life, the more they learn from it and grow from it. And in my case, it created uh, a fierce level of independence, uh, a recognition in an early age that no one was going to take care of me, that I had to find a way to do it myself. And uh, thankfully, the, uh, in my case, the solution ended up being education. I had people that, uh, even my father and mother who didn't even graduate from high school, so didn't understand the importance of education, they did understand that it was a differentiator. It would. It was something my dad used to say. They can take everything else away from you, but they can never take away your education. Which is, sounded a bit uh, a bit fatalistic, but he was right. And it did inspire me as a child to study, to read, to learn. Uh, I became a sponge, and that was really the single biggest difference in my life at an early age. Recognition that education makes all the difference in the world. 
in creating opportunity opening doors. Well, that's, that's uh, very inspiring and I know very difficult because I respect that a lot. Sometimes we take things for granted. Um, so just to, before we go to your fantastic career, so, so listening to you and understanding that these difficulties, so you took education very serious from the beginning and your parents gave you that as well, independent of the difficulties they went through. And as well, you achieve a fantastic education career because from the beginning you were an excellent student and you achieve as well some big things. So can you tell us about that? Because I think especially for young people listening to us, and I think during COVID, a lot of people might take things as feeling that is the end of the world or at least the end of their stuff. And at the end of the day, everyone has a story and that story is what makes us special, but as well what makes us different. So I would like to hear about that. Sure. Well, thank, thanks again uh, for the opportunity to, to, to tell that story because I think it's very powerful. In fact, I'm, I'm working on a book um, as, we, as we speak. Um, <clears throat> the, the title of the book will be similar to the name of a foundation that I created. Um, once I uh, got into the corporate world, I realized that uh, people were the most important things to corporations and fundamentally the need for an educated workforce uh, is fundamental to every company. So we created a foundation called Education is Freedom. That will be, not by coincidence, the name of my book as well that I'm working on, with the idea being that if we can get into the hearts of minds of, and minds of children at an early enough age and let them understand that it's not really about even formal education, but the more they learn about more and more things on a lifelong basis, not just while they're in school, the more opportunities open up for them. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's formal education, uh, certainly it can open up opportunities for a professional career. Uh, if it is an informal education, their ability to learn multiple languages uh, will allow them greater experiences as they begin to travel the world and understand cultures better. The more they learn about music or art, it will open up new doors for them. So the concept of education is freedom is something that's very important to me. And I think uh, through uh, both through this foundation, reaching out to uh, young children at an early age and helping them understand that opportunity, and also hopefully through a book, um, I, can, I can share some of those experiences, not just mine, but others, uh, who have been able to use education in different ways to open so many doors and, and bring so much more freedom, not, not just economic freedom, but freedom to enjoy life uh, in so many different ways through education. Yeah, and I love that concept, um, the idea of education is freedom. So, so one thing, uh, so looking at your background and um, you had, uh, well, one of the most amazing corporate careers uh, in the 20th century, let's put it that way, with leading two of the biggest uh, corporations, but as well, you have a very big uh, education. So you had, um, uh, you graduated cum laude um, uh, in terms of uh, Phi Beta Kappa with the bachelor degree from the College of the Holy Cross. And as well, after that, you had an MBA in the Columbia Business School. So that's, uh, that's two achievements in itself as well that probably mark your career and your corporate career. So can you tell us about, so from that background, that, that is story that you mentioned that was difficult and harsh from, from a lot of different standards that marks someone for life. Uh, and normally there are people that see themselves as victims and people that see that as an inspiration to make better. And, and I think that's what you, you're saying, which is the way I see myself, but not everyone unfortunately thinks like us. So a bit of this, if you could tell us a bit about that work from that experience, quite harsh in terms of childhood to having a strong and stellar uh, academic career, and then going to work for initially for Gulf Oil Corporation that became Chevron, and then for another petroleum company, so from over there in Texas. Uh, and as well, from that you went to 7-Eleven where you did as well a fantastic work of growing the company worldwide. So just a bit of that background. I think it's, for me particularly, it's wonderful to listen to someone with your experience and career. Well, sure. Uh, well, I'll, be, I'll begin with, um, if I was able to credit anything to whatever success I have enjoyed, 
whether it was academic success or prof success or professional success, um, it, it wasn't until later in life that I realized it really came down to three fundamental things that I felt I embraced as a child even, and, it, and I carried those three things through my professional career. And, and the first, this is where adversity comes in. A lot of people, as you said, they can either take adversity and all the challenges you face. COVID is a good example. Is this a terrible thing that's happening to all of us? We're all victims. Or is it an opportunity? Is it going to create so many open doors because of the way the world will change in a positive fashion? Um, so I, I, looking at, at the, the, that response, um, there are three, three strengths, I think, that I was able to have. I don't know if I, they were innate or, or if I was able to learn them, but the first is embracing change. Um, I was confronted with all kinds of change as a child. You know, the divorce of your parents, the condemnation of a home, having to, to move, be relocated, uncertain about your future. Today, I recognize that change is fundamental. It's part of life. And in every change, if you can embrace it and recognize that within that change could be opportunity, then it's a whole different attitude and a whole different approach as, a, as opposed to seeing yourself as a victim and, a, and, and, and having to suffer from that change. Uh, if, if you have your head down, then you'll never see the opportunity to come through that change in a positive way. The second um, is, is a, a function of confidence. Uh, for some reason, I believe I can do anything. <laughs> and, and, and I have to be really careful because confidence is a fine line between confidence and arrogance. And some people would interpret my, my confidence as arrogance, but it really is a fundamental belief that it's just a matter of hours and time and effort that I had would have to put into learning to be able to do anything that I'd love to do. So if I want to fly an airplane, it's just a matter of time. If I want to uh, learn to be an artist, it's just a matter of investing enough time and, and knowledge into learning how to paint. Or uh, if I wanted to become a doctor and take a complete change in career, it's, it's completely possible. And virtually all of us have that ability. The question is, do we have the confidence uh, that allows us to put in the time. And the third factor, and I'll, I'll come back to these later as we talk about my career and, and how they influence decisions and, and events within my career, but the third is not what you would think. It's actually simplicity. Um, I, I call them the C, three C's sometimes, change, confidence, and clarity. Uh, in clarity, I mean simplicity and, and uh, Everyone from Einstein to some of the greatest thinkers in the world have said, if you want to get across a great idea, you have to make it simple enough for people to understand it. And there's an elegance and simplicity that some of the most intelligent people in the world forget. <laughs> and so I have been successful in being able to break things down into such simple terms so that I can understand them that it helps me uh, in communicating, whether it's a corporate strategy uh, or a philanthropic opportunity. Uh, simplicity is so important. Um, so those are the three things that have, I've found um, uh, have worked for me throughout my life, frankly. Uh, that is beautiful. That shows as well your, um, your inspiration and as well your capacity to lead because leadership comes out of that, first of all, capacity to inspire other people, but a capacity as well to make things simple, even when things are not so easy. So, so and uh, you've been going through massive challenges. So I would like to, to go to your career now. So from um, that uh, fantastic uh, education level from Colombia as well, you went to the oil and gas industry. And then, of course, you start a, a fantastic career that went and took you to leading some of the world leading companies, and especially companies that when you leave them, we're on the verge of the epicenter of a lot of change. Because yeah. in the end of the day, uh, these companies, the two in particular, are, so uh, in the case of Blockbuster, of course, was in the epicenter of the, 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 the shift from uh, uh, conventional television and programming to then streaming. And then, of course, in 7-Eleven, you, you went into the sense of the mainstream globalization of these kind of stores that right now are all over the world and that 
when you started right. with not, so you made it happen uh, because it's no, it's a global brand. So I would like to hear about those two experiences and probably the background to them. Sure, I'll, I'll give you the first, uh, the first straight out of graduate school, I ended up at, at Gulf Oil Corporation, which was one of the seven sisters, one of the largest oil companies in the world. Um, uh, it was the larger at the time. Was the larger, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I think. yeah. It was. Uh, it was very, very successful uh, oil and gas uh, company, uh, and we. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to have an internship uh, during graduate school to work for them, and uh, the CEO of the company uh, at a at a lunch after that internship, um, literally invited me to come back to school and uh, finish my MBA and they would hire me full time. So uh, it was a great opportunity uh, to be able to start my career, w literally working for the CFO of Gulf Oil as they were doing merger and acquisition analysis. I was a kid at the time, I had no idea uh, what I was doing. But timing can be very important because I was actually, it was right at the cusp just as Apple launched its first PC. And uh, I was able to uh, do analysis very quickly on that PC. Um, well, literally, meanwhile, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing because I remembered, uh, brought back a memory of having to uh, do punch cards, computer punch cards, as things would be programmed in COBOL. Uh, and you'd have to put this deck of cards in a computer and it would spit it out and take forever. Uh, as opposed to that, we were able to, we were able to very quickly turn around analysis on a personal computer. Um, it, it was uh, a remarkable thing for the uh, older executives at Gulf to be able to see that this could happen. So uh, anyway, in, in that opportunity in working for the CFO, Gulf Oil uh, did a, try to acquire a company, uh, tried to acquire a company called City Service, another one of the major oil companies. It was unsuccessful. They failed. The uh, Wall Street was very critical of the acquisition. Gulf was weakened, and they ended up being themselves now the target of an acquisition, and they merged with Chevron uh, as a, another one of the very lar world's largest oil companies as a way to avoid that, that problem. So here I was early in my career uh, having a very successful learning experience at Gulf Oil, and it all came to an end. I, 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 we merged with Chevron. I had an opportunity to go to San Francisco, uh, the senior management, I was actually on the merger team and helping them put these two companies together. And the senior management, uh, one of the uh, very senior people at Chevron put his arm around my shoulder and said, don't know how you got to do this at this young age, but here you're going to have to pay your dues. <laughs> and uh, I was a little worried about that advice. <laughs> and the opportunity opened up to go to 7-Eleven. Uh, one of the uh, people that I was working with at Gulf uh, was hired by 7-Eleven. They had just acquired, ironically, City Service downstream uh, because City Service had also been weakened and was broken up and 7-Eleven uh, acquired their refining and marketing business. I happened to be sitting on a lot of data relating to that company, so uh, it was a very good fit. Uh, the, the gentleman that I was working with at Gulf became CEO at Citgo Petroleum, now owned wholly by 7-Eleven or the Southam Corporation at the time, and he asked me to come join him. So that was the first stage in the evolution. That's how I, that's how I landed at 7-Eleven. Again, adversity, crisis, what's going to happen to my career, ended up being an open door uh, and another opportunity presented itself. Well, that's wonderful. And I think it shows as well how things work in mystical ways, but as well in, uh, in as well, I think in the middle of all the challenges, there's always opportunities. So, so from that experience, so coming from Gulfstream that was acquired by Chevron and then from 7-Eleven. So how did it go managing 7-Eleven? Because you were quite young and as well, yeah. you had an experience mostly working with the corporation, but suddenly being CEO of one of the biggest uh, fast growing at the time, now it's still massive, but fast growing companies as well. So I would like to hear that part, but I think it's, it's, a, it's kind of a master in, in, a, <laughs> in experience in management as well. Well, again, it, it, it comes back to change uh, because I arrived at 7-Eleven 
my role was to help them integrate their gasoline, their uh, now refining and marketing business, Zipco Petroleum. Uh, a year after joining them, they decided to sell that business. We sold it to PDVSA, the uh, national oil company of Venezuela at the time. And 7-Eleven uh, asked me to stay and uh, run their retail gasoline business. So I started at 7-Eleven as an operator running the gasoline side of the business. 7-Eleven well, did an LBO. Uh, believe it or not, back in 1987, it sounds like 100 years ago now, they decided to take the company private and they took on to do it. Uh, well, first of all, they did it during the financial market collapse of 1987. And so October of 87, they were on a roadshow trying to sell investors on this idea of taking 7-Eleven private. The market collapsed, the stock was crushed, and the debt that we were going to take on at a massive increase in cost. Instead of pulling the deal, they went forward with it and they did an LBO, a leveraged buyout, at four, over $4 billion, believe it or not, between 16 and 17% interest rate. Now, in today's terms, it's hard to imagine that anyone would do that uh, with interest rates where they are today. You can imagine the cash flow requirement to satisfy the debt on $4 billion at 16.5% average cost it was staggering. So that event that happened at 7-Eleven caused a huge liquidity crisis. They proceeded with the event, but it was just a matter of time. By 1990, the company was facing bankruptcy. And so here I made the, the move from one of the largest oil companies in the world to uh, 7-Eleven and they, and they were bankrupt. They were filing for chapter 11 protection, 1990. Um, a great story for you. I went to the CEO of the company, chairman of the company at the time. He was the son of the founder. I said, uh, his name was John Thompson. I said, what, what should I do? Should I, I'm a young guy still. I was still early twenties. Should I go find another career? And he, and he told me the story about his dad. And it, this is a perfect story if you'll, if you'll indulge my, my storytelling for a bit. I oh, love it. <laughs> okay, great. It's, but it's the perfect story of adversity because 7-Eleven started in 1927 as an ice house called the Southland Ice Company. One little store in the south side of Dallas. They were selling 50 pound blocks of ice in Dallas, Texas, if you can imagine for people to put in their ice box, because that's how they kept things cold. There was no refrigeration at the time. In 1927 or 1928, right after they founded this one company, the frigid air was invented. Now all of a sudden people could have an ice box in their home, plug it in the wall, and they didn't need 50 pound blocks of ice. So they would have gone out of business. And he told me the story of his dad facing that crisis. What do we do? we're going to go out of business. Their sales started to go down. He said that they started to talk to the customers and ask the customers what they want, what else could they do? And the customers told them, you already have the ice to keep things cold. Why don't you sell me the, the bread and the milk, the other things I need for my ice box. I already come here, not because of ice. I come here because you're convenient. You made it convenient for me to get ice, make it convenient for me to get the other things. That was literally how, the convenience store, or 7-Eleven at least, was born. And they went from that one store to many, many more stores, uh, and it created the concept. His message to me with telling me that story was, if you dial forward from 1927 when they faced that crisis, here they were in bankruptcy in 1990. He said, our problem is the same. We sell beer, cigarettes, and soft drinks because that's what people needed for convenience for the last 20 years. But obviously everyone else sells those things. Clearly they don't need those things conveniently. Your job is to find things that people need more conveniently. And as long as you satisfy that demand for convenience, you should stay with the company because there will be no limit to what we can sell. Beer sales, cigarette sales, they may decline. The need for convenience will never go away took his advice, stayed with the company, 
came through that adversity and came out of bankruptcy. I ended up in charge of strategic planning for the company on the other side of the, uh, of the restructuring. Uh, our Japanese licensee ended up becoming our largest shareholder, put money into 7-Eleven. Uh, that led to, from the head of planning, I was able to create a plan. They ended up making me chief financial officer of the company. We reemerged as a public company again on the New York Stock Exchange. I became CFO. Um, so I had a chance to lay out the plan for the new company. Then I had a chance to finance the new company as chief financial officer and redo the balance sheet to make it possible. Then I became chief operating officer and I had a chance to execute now that plan and then ultimately chief executive officer uh, in the year 2000, which gave me the opportunity now to uh, lead that strategy to the next level and, and help it uh, prosper as a, as a global corporation. It was a great experience. Wow, this was a great achievement. You put it so, so simple, <laughs> but uh, it was a massive. So you went from a bankrupt company to re-enlisted the company and actually uh, explore it to become one of the biggest convenience stores in the world because at the time it was mostly just in the US and even in the US was when he took over he was quite young still. he was not so big as what we're talking right now that is so big and during your tenure as CEO so well that's amazing and as well it shows as well the power of how to look at adversity but as well to find solutions in the middle of this thing so how did you came then, or did you went from from uh, then from 7-Eleven to a company like Blockbuster? Because it's a completely different beast, let's put it that way. So I'm just curious. Well, first I have to clarify two things because I, I don't want to take credit for the global growth. 7-Eleven actually uh, was growing globally uh, all the way back into the uh, early 80s. Uh, and the largest and most successful operations ended up being in Asia. Uh, 7-Eleven Japan, 7-Eleven Taiwan, 7-Eleven yeah. uh, Thailand were very, very successful uh, in licensed operations. We were actually able to learn from their success and reinvent 7-Eleven uh, both domestically and globally by sharing in the success of others. So uh, I did want to clarify that. Uh, I, I was able to help that international growth. We took 7-Eleven to China. We were uh, invited by the Chinese government to bring 7-Eleven in. Uh, we're able to do that, uh, but it was, it was just a phenomenal experience. The other thing before moving on to Blockbuster, because it will help, it will help you understand the Blockbuster story is uh, I want to tie back the 7-Eleven experience to those three things that I mentioned. If I hadn't been able to embrace change, most of the management at 7-Eleven, when we experienced bankruptcy, a lot of people left. A lot of people had their head down, very depressed. They saw it as a very bad thing. Uh, to go through in a crisis, and they weren't able to embrace it as an opportunity. Embracing that opportunity and taking the words of the founder or the founder's son, the chairman of the company, take it to heart and creating that change is what made it possible. Having the confidence to do it, to be able to say, I, I am not a traditional CFO, but I can do this job because I know it needs to be done. And if I don't know, I'll learn it. I'll make it, I'll make it happen. And then finally, the simplicity to lay out a, a change in, in the way we distributed products to stores, get daily distribution and things that people thought were impossible. We were able to accomplish because we kept it very simple and clear for everyone from our franchisees to our employees to our shareholders to really understand how we did that. And the result was 10 years of improved same store sales, a tenfold increase in the, in the stock value of the company and the share value of the company when we ultimately sold the company in 2005 uh, to our largest licensee, 7-Eleven Japan. Uh, and they then took that platform and took it to a completely another different level. They now have over, uh, I believe over 80,000 stores uh, worldwide today. So uh, very proud of what they've done uh, for, for the company. But it, is, it does come down to those three things, which will lead me into why in the world did you do Blockbuster? No, that, that's amazing. And I like uh, your honesty as well on this, because of course, uh, independent of the growth overseas, you, you are actually in the mothership company. <laughs> and if the mothership company was sinking, <laughs> someone would have to take it. Otherwise, it will sink, the boat will sink. So in the end of the day, 
the captain, it was you, of course, as in the management team, but he went from, from cleaning that history to create new solutions and as well to, to healing and to the point of taking to the, to the exchange as well and, and put it public. So yeah, it's, it's quite an amazing history. And I love that as well. One of the things that has been part of your career is actually this part of cr global financial crisis. So you went from one in the 80s in Blockbuster, you went as well. But before that, I would like to go to the history of, of Blockbuster. It's quite interesting, that shift from, from a global convenience store to, to an entertainment uh, first distributing house, which was Blockbuster was massive at the time as well. Sure. Yeah, Blockbuster was at the time, they were massive. They had 7,000 stores worldwide. Uh, the number one name in entertainment distribution. Uh, and so you might say, why, why in the world did you go from, <laughs> from this successful convenience store uh, business to decide to go to Blockbuster? Well, first of all, we had sold 7-Eleven. So uh, I had, after 21 years, I decided that it was a great experience, but it was time to try something else. And so uh, rather than stay with the new entity, I decided to, uh, to, to, see what was out there for opportunities. And Blockbuster was undergoing crisis at the time. They were trying to evolve, uh, but they were not as successful as they could be. They were experiencing a lot of cash flow challenges. Uh, Netflix had just come out and they put together a competitive alternative to Netflix uh, called uh, uh, Blockbuster On Demand. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, it was the, the uh, blockbuster by mail, basically, uh, that allowed people to do what Netflix did, order DVDs uh, via the mail, and they would show up two or three, a uh, couple of days later. Uh, and then Blockbuster had a unique uh, advantage where they would let people uh, return those uh, DVDs back to the store and exchange them for something else they'd like. It's a tremendously expensive startup operation for Blockbuster. And Wall Street was looking at them saying, they have a billion dollars of debt. And this was in uh, the year 2007, they had a billion dollars of debt. Uh, and will they be able to make that transformation uh, to a different kind of format? What will happen at the stores? I looked at the business and said, very much like 7-Eleven. It is convenient access to media entertainment. Convenience is convenience. In the words of John Thompson, the, the chairman of 7-Eleven, uh, if you can find ways to provide customer the convenience they want, then the business will never fail. And so the question was, how do we make it even more convenient for media entertainment consumers to get access to the content that they would like. Well, at the time, streaming wasn't developed very effectively. About the only streaming that was going on was a little bit of uh, video game streaming and kids using their Xbox uh, to uh, access some limited amount of content. The studios had put together uh, a new company called Movie Link. Uh, that would control digital rights. And most everyone was still consuming their content via DVDs at the time. So our idea was to build on what the company had already started and create a, uh, they had already created a, an, an offering called Total Access for Blockbuster customers. So if you wanted to get DVDs in the store, you could. If you wanted them by mail, you could. When I arrived at the company, uh, we added kiosks, a la, there was a service called Redbox in the United States that offered via kiosk outside of retail stores, you could get a DVD, a rent a DVD. And then the first thing we did when I arrived at Blockbuster is to acquire this company called MovieLink, one of the first digital streaming companies. So in spite of the perception that Blockbuster missed that window, we were one of the first to have streaming, digital streaming capabilities. So we had true total access. So then you might say, well, what, what, what happened to Blockbuster? Uh, well, we had, when I arrived in 2007, we set out on a plan. By the uh, third quarter of 2008, uh, we had doubled EBITDA for the company. So the earnings of the company 
was dramatically improving. Uh, we were hoping to get our debt rating improved so that we could restructure our debt, refinance our debt going forward. And everything was looking good. We had just bought this streaming company. We were, we were getting praise from Wall Street. Then in the third quarter, I think it was November of 2007, Lehman Brothers collapsed. The banks began to shut down. The real estate market was tumbling. And again, here I was facing another financial crisis. Yeah, you, know, you, start to, you start to think, you know, is, this, is it me? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was history repeating itself again. Uh, and so, unfortunately, uh, this time it was a little bit harder to be able to recover because Blockbuster had a billion dollars of debt, as I mentioned. Uh, a third of that debt was due in 2009, and the banks in the first quarter of 2009 were absolutely shut down. So there was, it was very difficult, if not impossible. We were able to uh, arrange a loan to refinance part of that debt that was due in 2009, uh, but ultimately it was just a matter of time uh, before the uh, studios gave up and said, we're afraid that you know, we'll not be able to get paid. And so they took away our credit terms and the rest was history. We had no choice but to put the company into a restructuring. Uh, in the, I think it was the middle or the end of 2009 that we put the company into a restructuring. Even then, the opportunity was there. I was in discussions with Google to partner with them. I was in discussions with a couple of other very large players, uh, Dish Networks, uh, Korean Telecom, all very interested in partnering with Blockbuster so that they could help us make that transition, finish that transition to digital streaming capabilities. Ultimately, uh, we were able to partner with Dish, even though we had uh, restructuring uh, Dish Networks was willing to buy the company out of and help us reemerge from bankruptcy. We did as a, uh, uh, as a, uh, we were able to sell the company uh, in that restructuring to Dish Networks, uh, and their vision was to take it that final step. Um, they weren't able to do that for a whole host of reasons that I'll share if you're interested. But, uh, but they, uh, but it was, it was that that opportunity that we had, we had a window of opportunity. Uh, we didn't get there. Perhaps one day Dish will resurrect the Blockbuster brand and, and uh, uh, give it the digital capabilities as a full aggregator that it, it, we originally envisioned, but, uh, uh, but they're not there yet. Wow, that's that's a, actually this this is the probably the less known history of Blockbuster because I I think a lot of people have the history that Blockbuster was not fast enough, but actually it was not the case. It was actually it was victim of his own circumstances. It's quite interesting, even for me. I, in terms of history, I didn't have that perception. I, I understood that the company was not fast enough because it's interesting. Even here in the UK, the brand Blockbuster is still present. You still see right. it in some streets. I, I actually. Not I, I live in the center of London, and there's places where you can see the brand blockbuster and some places that didn't change. So, yeah, it's it's amazing how, and as well, how history repeat twice because you, you went through two massive financial crises. That's actually, um, I think only COVID right now is as big, which is another one, but thanks to God, you're not right now going to through the, the challenge that, that it went. So, so I think after this, so just, um, this is not easy task and actually, comprehends a huge amount of stress. Uh, as a CEO, I'm sure that you have uh, to face all these, these questions and jobs and as well all the people involved. And it's not an easy task as well to define, but still you manage it particularly well. Like you mentioned, selling to, to dish networks and as well all the, the, the different where areas that you've been, that you manage still to, to work. So after that, um, so you've been focused on um, the Freedom Foundation and uh, education is freedom and that was created in 2002 actually during the tenure still so can you tell us about that and as well well first of all with this because one of the things i've been facing myself is that uh, big normally someone that achieves some big failure is because it tries something big and uh, and uh, very few people understand that because people are afraid of failure so I would like to ask that because it was not your failure. Actually, none of this was your failure. It was organizations that you were managing 
but had an history previous to you. It's not like you were the person that took the ship to the sinking. Um, so, so I just would like to hear your opinion because I think for me as a CEO and as an author and as a researcher, this is what I learned and this is what I want to understand how each person can actually look at this adversity and actually take it forward because most of people really don't have the strength. And, and for instance, if you see um, most of the people that, for instance, Edison went from seven, Thomas Edison, the biggest inventor, was from seven bankruptcies, I think. Yeah. Um, and very few people speak about that, of course. <laughs> Even Elon Musk, when he sold the money for, for uh, the first PayPal acquisition, he burned all the money to create Tesla and he almost went bankrupt <laughs> a couple of right. times and actually had to, I saw the history, he had to actually give the, the house of his parents-in-law as a guarantee to the bank, which is not an easy task. So people normally don't look at these details. So I would like to hear a bit of some, some, some insights from that, because I think it's, uh, it's really quite inspiring, but as well, I know that it's not easy to be on that position. Sure, well, you know, it, it, it comes right back. I'm gonna give you those three things again uh, that, that have given me strength over the years, because uh, adversity, uh, can make you strong. And had I not dealt with the things that I had to deal with in my childhood, in my early career, uh, then I wouldn't have been able to deal with the kind of challenges that I faced at Blockbuster. They were, they were quite intense. Uh, a gentleman named Carl Icahn was our lead shareholder. Uh, very good partner, but also very tough. Uh, uh, it came down to uh, being able to understand the change. You know, I, I chose to take on that challenge because I knew that the change was happening. I didn't realize we were going to face the tsunami economically uh, in the financial world that we face. So that was an unexpected uh, element of change. It still could have led to further opportunity. Um, there were a couple of decisions I wish I could have had back. We had a chance to acquire that content, uh, not just movie link the company, we had the chance to acquire the content uh, behind it on an exclusive basis, which would have left Netflix selling DVDs by mail still. <laughs> it would have uh, given us exclusive access to it. It also would have bankrupt the company sooner, yet we could have restructured around that. Now, um, I, I wish I had that decision over again. I would have, I would have made a different decision had we had that opportunity, had I known uh, what the future would bear. But I recognize that, you know, change happens. And, uh, and I had the confidence to deal with it, with what I knew at the time. And confidence, that second element, is so important because business is not personal. And so many people take it personally. So when my, my picture appeared in the New York Post, full color, half page, with a Pinocchio nose, and I had friends from New York seeing the New York Post, sending me the picture, laughing about it. I could have taken that very personally um, because I, at the time, and the reason they, they, they printed that is I was sure we were not going to file bankruptcy and ultimately we had to file bankruptcy. And so the accusation was I lied. Pinocchio knows New York Post. It's not personal. I made the right decisions, the best decisions I could with the information I had at the time. So that confidence is so important. And then finally, the simplicity factor. If I could have done anything, I would have been better at describing the process to take the company digital. So I, I think I could have improved my ability to communicate in a simple fashion. It was an emerging business. It was very difficult to describe, but I think I could have done a better job there. So those three things helped me get through that uh, crisis for Blockbuster. Uh, yes, it could have come out differently. Uh, yes, I still have to deal with the issues of perception around what happened to Blockbuster. Uh, but here's the, uh, I'll give you one last piece that is a, it's very helpful to me uh, because it ties back to this role of adversity. You know, think about other people that have dealt with adversity in their lives and you know, someone like Nelson Mandela comes to mind. Well, Nelson Mandela, I had privilege when I was setting up Education as Freedom, I actually had a, an opportunity to reach out to him and, and he was contemplating the idea of joining us as, a, as an honorary chairman. He gave us a, 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 
a quote for an event we did, or a, a, a soundbite actually did a video for an event we did at Radio City Music Hall. Nelson Mantella, one of my favorite quotes that he has is, I never lose. I never lose. I win or I learn. And if you think about that, it is the ultimate expression of the power of adversity. I don't lose when times are tough, when the world is against me, when everything looks like it's as the blackest of night, the darkest of night. I don't learn, I don't lose, I learn. I have an opportunity to learn from that experience and come out the other side as a better person, a better businessman, um, and, and, and a stronger individual overall. So I, I, I love that Nelson Mandela quote. And if, if you were to say, what would summarize that experience, that blockbuster more than anything else and how I made it through, it's that knowledge that, you know, there is no such thing as losing. It's, it's a question of powering through, learning from it, and, 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 and hopefully not repeating those mistakes on the other side. Yeah, but in your case, it was not completely your mistakes. It was an entire ecosystem. And I think that is, uh, I think, one of the most important things that uh, no business school can teach you or no, um, no I think, uh, that's why I respect entrepreneurs more and more. <laughs> but I think it, it's really important because it's very easy to criticize in the outside. But when you are inside, there's so much, I think no one actually wants to be in a situation like that. But you were as well, when you came to the company, the company had these difficulties. So, it's actually, I think, honor to you and history should make your history because you're still young, you can still do a lot of things. But I think it's really impressive because I think uh, that story needs to be retold. And I hope these interviews can actually show as well that because it's, it's really important that people look at the details and then don't judge the, the, the pictures based on, on some elements, which normally sometimes happens. Sometimes people are very lucky because they are the right time or the right thing. And sometimes, of course, we're lucky, we are lucky because of history. But that makes as well, that, that makes you as well pass to the next level. So I would like to go right now in terms of, uh, let's focus on the present and as well on the future, because I know that you are full of energy doing a lot of things. So you have, so you created the, uh, the uh, Freedom um, Education Platform. You are as well working a lot in aeronautics and the for-profit part. So can you tell us about the two projects, how they work together and your ambition and presently the things you're doing right now? Sure. Uh, well, if you, if you, uh, if you're to try to describe what I do now, it's actually pretty hard to describe because I saw myself before as an entrepreneur. Uh, but in fact, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was nominated for uh, Ernst and Young has an entrepreneur of the year. Uh, award that they give. And I was nominated when I was at 7-Eleven to be Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, and yet it was their first or second year of creating this award. And they struggled with it because the definition of an entrepreneur, you don't think of a corporate person as being an entrepreneur, even though I, I, I thought I was an entrepreneur at 7-Eleven and trying to create a new platform, a new distribution system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yet uh, they didn't see it that way. So I, I washed out in the first round. They said, no, you're, he's, not, he's not really an entrepreneur, he's a corporate person. So uh, from that experience, I thought, well, that, that, that's not fair. I, you know, uh, taking on the Blockbuster Challenge, I saw that as, as a, an entrepreneurial uh, effort. Um, but it was, it was, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was yeah, entrepreneur. <laughs> but it was still a, a big corporate role, so people don't think of uh, a corporate entrepreneur as I felt that I was. Um, so since leaving the, the big corporate world, I've decided I'm, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I am going to set my sights on things that I can help to transform uh, and take on, you know, perhaps more, more uh, bite-sized challenges, if you will. So I've taken on some of those, and that's what I've been working on for the last few years is uh, helping a lot of startups. Uh, I've done a lot of things in the uh, technology space and the um, uh, AR, VR world, a little bit in the artificial intelligence world, a couple of projects there. Um, I've, I've been, uh, as an avocation, I've been a pilot since, uh, since I can remember. I uh, wanted to be an astronaut as a kid growing up and uh, learned to fly at a very early age. So um, as you can probably tell from the background in my office, I am uh, fascinated with all things aerospace and aviation. So I've been working on uh, a couple of projects related to the aerospace world that are 
kind of interesting startup in, in the hypersonics uh, area that I think is the next emerging uh, space. I'm doing some things with vertical takeoff and landing. I, I fly helicopters and uh, and jets, and uh, uh, so I'm I'm also interested in the emerging technology for vertical takeoff and landing with battery power. I think that will be the next big thing in aviation. Uh, Uber Elevate is an example to be able to move freely about cities 200 feet above uh, highways. It's fascinating uh, emerging uh, industry. Uh, and uh, I'm doing a little bit uh, in the <laughs> aggressor airspace, which is uh, something very unique. The Army and the Air Force in the United States have outsourced the role a bad guy for Top Gun training. So uh, it presents an opportunity. I'm negotiating two or three different countries to buy their retired fleets of Mirage fighters or you know uh, older last generation fighter jets to bring here to the U.S., um, upgrade them with modern avionics and put them on the line uh, with the Air Force and the Navy as trainers to be able to uh, train uh, our uh, F-35 pilots how to identify an adversary target and, uh, and engage with them. And so it's a kind of a, an interesting piece of it. So those, it's just a little snapshot of some of the entrepreneurial things I've been working on. Wow, that's amazing. So, so I wanna, I wanna um, touch um, as someone that has been in education for all my life, but of course someone that has a lot to learn. So, so from your experience with your foundational education work um, and all the, the work relative, you mentioned Nelson Mandela, and you mentioned a lot of work you've been doing with children and as well young children or young adults. So what would be some of the conclusions you have on that because education is going through a massive challenge and as well a massive uh, disruption because in the end of the day in one end you mentioned artificial intelligence and even what you're doing in in airplanes and right now most of the pilots are learning through virtual reality and different things like that and as well they making piloting probably drones to start and so all of these things are really changing very fast but uh, but most of our education didn't change still it's still really based on a lot of uh, old fashioned stuff. Of course, that we need to keep the rules and the, and the history, but how do you see that? And you have a lot of experience both working on that and you saw as well from your management perspective, all the change from corporation to entrepreneurship and as well then dealing with children and with young adults. So I would like to hear because your experience is particularly unique, especially with your experience in so diverse areas. Sure. Well, I, I, it sounds a bit extraordinary, but I believe that COVID um, may have been the best thing to ever happen to education in our lifetime. Um, and, and that sounds crazy because kids were not able to go to school. Uh, they had to adopt a virtual learning platforms that are currently inadequate. But here's what happened. I, I believe strongly that the COVID crisis has accelerated technology and its ability to transform education by as much as 20 years. It was coming, it was happening. We were using technology in small ways to improve our ability to educate, but the pace was very, very slow. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, in Dallas, uh, where I happen to live, I'm doing this, this uh, broadcast at the moment, uh, in Dallas, 40% of the public school children in this community um, didn't have any access to Wi-Fi. So zero, they had no Wi-Fi access at all. Oh. Um, how do you educate a child virtually with no Wi-Fi access? AT&T in this community stepped up, gave a million dollars, put Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the community. So that piece of the puzzle has been fixed. It could have taken 10 years for this community to get Wi-Fi access otherwise. So now they have it. So then you look at the tools that they're using. There are many wonderful tools, Google Classroom, hundreds of, of wonderful uh, educational access tools. Most of them are geared toward teaching in the same way we did for the last 100 years. And I, I'll give you a classic example of that. I, I'm privileged, privileged to sit on the board of Columbia Business School. And uh, they were proudly at a board meeting via Zoom sharing their, one of their virtual classes. And here was the professor 
standing in front of the same blackboard that I sat in the same classroom that I sat in 40 years ago. <laughs> Frightening thought. And the breakthrough, it was, he was broadcasting and one of the big breakthroughs was he had a clear mask so that the students in class were protected because he had a mask on, but the students that were virtual could see his lips move. Now contrast that classroom experience to what's possible. In today's technology, it's possible to have that class be sitting, that camera be sitting in the PepsiCo boardroom where they're having a board meeting, making a decision about a new product, and then have that, that classroom video immediately go to a bottling plant where the product is running through the line. And then in two seconds later, you're at the retail store where they're stocking that product and you can see how the decision in the boardroom affects the bottling plant and, about, and affects that retail store. And you can see co consumers interacting then with that product. You get the full experience. Technology allows us to immerse people in the learning experience in ways that would have otherwise required 20 years of experience in a company to have those, those same kinds of uh, exposure to those same kinds of decision-making processes. That's just one example. So the idea is that this now is a portal to learn anything from a new language to basic core mathematics uh, to virtually anything. How do we improve the pathways for students? First of all, getting them the access to the technology, but also making seamless integration of the many tools that are out there using blockchain, something I know you're closely, uh, closely involved with, using blockchain to secure their grades and their transcripts. So as they go to these different places and get course credit, that course credit is accumulated. Using blockchain also to secure scholarship dollars from around the world that can come in and provide rewards. Just as video games reward you and allow you to level up, we can provide scholarship, securely scholarship dollars through blockchain technology integrated into these learning platforms so students all along the way are literally earning the right to go to college um, because of their participation uh, in these classes and in these programs and these learning programs. Technology has the opportunity to completely transform the way we learn, the way we can access education, and the way we can afford education. And so that's, that's one of the missions that I'm on right now is to help prototype this possible world, this possible new world of technology. Right here in our backyard in Dallas, I'm working on a virtual education program with the superintendent of schools in Dallas to try to create in what he would describe of, uh, as uh, in pursuit of wow. We're trying to build a, uh, it's a project called Operation Dream Big, where we would engage the business community to come in and help us fund this transformational approach to virtual learning uh, that will take a crisis, COVID-19, and turn it into an opportunity to change the way uh, our public school students here in Dallas are able to learn. Well, wonderful. And I think I love that vision and actually I share it completely and being someone in the blockchain industry for a long time, actually one of the first people writing about it, I. And I count on me to help on that because I think it's really important. And I think it's more critical than ever because at the moment, like you mentioned, we have a paradox of a lot of technology, but people not using it for the right things and as well using it for the wrong things, most of it. Um, I probably will do another podcast just about education once you have time. But well, so uh, in, in the sense of time, and I know that we passed one hour, so just one, one or two last questions. So the last one, so uh, on, the, on the part of... Um, on the your work in, in the aeronautic and as well as the pilot, you have your, your uh, 
playing behind you. So just a bit <laughs> of, uh, or behind you as well in, the, <laughs> in different ways, yes. So just uh, how did you come to that industry and what you do in that on the for-profit work, just for the people that uh, are curious to see where you are right now? Uh, aviation is one of those one of those areas that uh, is is still um, an emerging opportunity. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, the advances in technology, if you think about it, the Wright brothers flew uh, just over a hundred years ago. And uh, since then we've made some advances, but Technology in aviation has not come along as fast as in other areas. So we are today on the cusp of a complete revolution in the ability to move people more efficiently, um, more uh, uh, environmentally uh, friendly ways uh, via alternative uh, forms of power. Battery power, for example, is an exciting new uh, arena in aviation. Uh, I've been working with a number of companies that are that are that have now discovered uh, that you can power flight via battery in ways that are much, much more efficient than traditional jet fuel or aviation fuel. In fact, a, a story I just heard, one of the co-founders of, of uh, Tesla, I had an opportunity to attend a uh, aviation summit here in uh in dallas ironically and he was one of the keynote speakers for it and he told the story about how uh meeting elon musk he actually first took took him the idea of a battery powered airplane he had been working on uh on uh, battery technology nicad batteries linking them all up in his dorm room in college he took that idea to elon musk that said we could power an aircraft with nicad batteries uh, linked together. And uh, apparently Musk turned to him and said, that's a dumb idea. I don't think we're ready for that yet, but what about putting it in a car? And they literally uh, took an old Lotus and, and refit it with these batteries. And that became the uh, platform from which Tesla was built. But the technology today versus 10 or 15 years ago, when, when they were working on that, has dramatically improved the battery technology. So I think that next big breakthrough you'll see uh, will be in the ability to power uh, uh, aircraft via battery. And that just opens up a whole new world of opportunity. I don't have doubts actually. I'm glad you're talking about that because I was actually thinking about that recently and talking with some friends and why we don't have all the planes like electrics because it would, it's the biggest uh, carbon footprint. It would save most of the problem. And I think it's not rocket science, actually quite easy because in the end of the day, if you can get power, all these cars, it's not so difficult to power a plane. It's mostly probably the scalability and making sure that all this industry that is legacy systems that has to, to probably change that. So <laughs> they, I'm sure that they have just changing that is a massive, that's probably why they didn't do it still. I understand as well, it's not so easy just suddenly to delete everything. So, so I think, so and I will wrap up and I appreciate your time as well. I probably would have to, questions for five hours so i know that you're <laughs> conscious of your time so you mentioned covid as an accelerator for the education but as an accelerator for anything because in the end of the day right now so that's there's the negative part that is all the financial the health and the, the lives of the thousands actually one million people that died but as well one thing that i always like to remind on the positive side is that if you make a parallel in 1920 um when actually 7-Eleven was created or part of that, there was a pandemic that killed 200 million people, okay? This was 100 years ago. And at the time, there was only around 2 billion people in the planet, less than that. Now we have 8 billion, okay? And still, the number of deaths is still, of course, is tragic. And our relatives and people in our networks have died and everyone else that deserves all the respect. But still, we managed to achieve all of this and keep talking and keep business even with all these challenges that we're still facing. And to be honest, I don't think we'll be sa safe for the next six months, we still have to go. But so from your experience, you mentioned on education, you mentioned on, on the aeronautics and all this part, they will be definitely. But I, I see as well from the digital transformation for a lot of different things. So I would like to hear your views, someone like you that came from oil and gas to convenience stores to streaming and now to aeronautics and education, which is kind of all complementary in a lot of ways, but very diverse as well. 
Well, it's, it's simple. Embrace change, have confidence to do something about it, and then have clarity of vision and how to move it forward. It's those, it's those same three things because ultimately um, in crisis is opportunity. In, adverse, in adversity is opportunity. Um, if you can see through the dark clouds to the, to the clear skies on the other side, and whether the, the turbulence of the storm as you're making it through, uh, the opportunity will be there. So today, uh, I see tremendous opportunity in whether it's in business or in education, uh, you know, or in many people in the case of their personal lives. Uh, there's there's so much opportunity now being created by this crisis that we have. Um, think about the, the many industries that will be changed. Uh, the emergence of technologies now or acceleration of technologies for home delivery of foods. Um, the, uh, something as simple as, as church services I know are being constrained, but there are more people now that have access to church services via video and they're able to participate in ways that they couldn't before. Um, there are families now that didn't have time because they were all so busy and they were traveling so much that are now having so much more family time than they did before. And how much will our, will our workday change going forward as people realize, A, the use of technologies that allow me to be more efficient in my time and B, allow more time with family. Um, so there's, there, there are, I believe, many blessings within this crisis that we won't realize today because we're in the middle of it. We're in the turbulence. We're in the dark clouds. It's yes. scary. Uh, none of us are feeling very confident <laughs> right now uh, or embracing this change. But uh, on the other side, I think the, the future is very bright. I think uh, this crisis will accelerate so much in society that's good uh, that I'm very optimistic about the future. Well, I, I, I wrap up on this note and this positive, and I think it's been a fantastic and inspiring. I have a lot of notes that I took here and I, as well our team. So James, I, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I definitely want to do a second one about education and about aeronautics and the, more about the future. I think today we've, we went through more for the past and, uh, and definitely count on me for your education efforts because it's one of the areas that I'm humble trying to do as well, probably more on the digital. I don't have your experience on the corporate side, but as well, uh, humbly learning from your experience, which I think it's, it's uh, one of the, the wonderful things is your, um, you went through a lot, so I respect a lot, but as well, you're stronger than ever. I see that you're going still to change the world or continue changing it. So James, thank you so much. It's been a huge honor and privilege. Thank you. I enjoyed the opportunity. Thank you for helping to spread the word. We, uh, we all appreciate it. Thanks. No, no, we will. <laughs> Thank you so much.